Section 5.2, Functions. I'm going to start off with a few definitions here. A relation, a domain, and a range. A relation is any set of ordered pairs, and the domain of a relation is the set of all the values of the independent variable, and the range of the relation is the set of all the values of the dependent variable. So just a reminder, when we talk about the independent variable in the domain, they're calling it the independent variable, but we also might think of it as the inputs. And typically, for us, that would mean x values. And when they talk about the range, they're saying it's the dependent variable, but that means it would be the outputs. Or typically for us, that would mean the y values. So that's another way you can think of that in addition to how they define it in the book. And then another definition is that of a function. And a function is a special relation in which each input leads to exactly one output. So they've got four different relation, relations shown here, relation 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're all relations because they're sets of ordered pairs, 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, 18, 1, 45, 6, 25. Those are all ordered pairs, so they're all relations. And they want to know which of these are functions. So let me show you the ones that violate the rule of function, and hopefully that will help you to start to get this definition. Relation 2 is not a function, and that's because if I ask you, where does 5 go? There's many answers. You kind of are left saying, well, which 5? This 5 goes to 27, but this 5 goes to 21. If it's really a function and I say, where does the input of 5 go? There's only one answer in that table. So as soon as I see that this input leads to many different outputs, for this one, I have to say no. This one is not a function. And then... Uh, how about this one then? Where does 1 go? 3. Where does 2 go? 4. Where does 3 go? 5. But also to 6. So this is going to be another no. It was looking good for a while. 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 7. But if I say where does 3 go? You could say, well, this 3 goes to 5 and this 3 goes to 6. Which one did you mean? And as soon as there's that little bit of uncertainty, it's not a function. So how about this one? Where does 0 go? 50. So it's a we often say this is a mapping, that 0 maps over to the y value, and x of 0 maps over the y of 50. Where does 1 go? 45. Where does 2 go? 40. Where does 3 go? 35. Where does 4 go? 30. Each of these numbers has a unique um, destination, so there's never this case where you say, well, which 3? Which 5? Right? That's where we run into trouble. So is this one a function? Yes. And then how about this one? Where does 3 go? 11. Where does 4 go? 13. Where does 5 go? To 17. Where does 6 go? To 25. Where does 7 go? To 40. Each of these numbers was unique and had its own destination, so we can say yes to that as well. I do want to add another one here that kind of came up as I was thinking through this one. So let me add a relation 5 and put an x and y table for that one. And let's see, for the x's, um, I'll just use these, this same list, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then for the outputs, I'll do 2, and 7, and 18, and 7, and 4. So is this one a function? Sometimes people will say no, because they'll notice the two different 7's right there, and they'll say, oh, we can't have repeats. But it's okay, because I, if I say, where does 4 go? It goes to 7. Where does 6 go? It happens to also go to 7. That's fine. Two different inputs can go to the same output. For it to be a function, each input has to go to exactly one output. So it's if the input goes to one more than one place, that's where you have trouble. If more than one input goes to the same output, it's not a problem. So this is another one that we could say yes to, despite the fact that we have the repeat in the range or the output side. All right. Okay, continuing on to page 4, I want to look at that same question of determining whether these graphs represent functions, just like we were answering for the table. One of the things you want to remember about a graph is it's actually a set of ordered pairs that have been plotted. And so just like we were looking at ordered pairs before, we're still looking at ordered pairs. It's just once you start making these graphs, you get infinitely many. So we said that something is not a function if there was an x value that went to more than one y. So let's say I drew a vertical line right here. I don't know what x that is. Let's just throw this artificial scale on there and say that that's an x of 3. So where does 3 go to? Well, 3 goes to a few spots. This ordered pair has an x of 3. Here's another ordered pair on the graph that has an x of 3. And here's another ordered pair on the graph that has an x of 3. 
when you have three points here that all have the same x but different y's, that's a violation of that rule where we say, where does 3 go? Well, which one? This 3, that 3, this 3? So is this one a function? We're going to say no. And then how about this one? Well, the way we do it is we try and draw a vertical line that hits in more than one spot, because if it does, that's going to be a violation. But no matter where I draw vertical lines here, they always seem to hit the graph in just one place. And what that means, a vertical line represents a specific x value, if it only hits the graph in one place, then that x only has one y that goes with it, and we can say yes. So, same thing here. If I start slicing this one up, I never can find a vertical line that hits the graph more than once. Whenever that's the case, you can say yes, that's a function. This one actually is a vertical line. Most vertical lines I would draw wouldn't hit the graph at all, but when I do draw one that hits it, it hits it a bunch of times. So all these points are ordered pairs that are part of the function, and they all have the same x but different y's, so that makes this one a no. So when you're looking at a graph and you want to know is it a function or not, we have a quick check on that called the vertical line test. And it states that if a relation is, or sorry, a relation is a function, if and only if every vertical line intersects the graph of the relation at no more than one point. We call this the requirement the vertical line test. You could say it differently too. If you can find any vertical line that hits it more than once, then you're going to get a no. If you can't, then it's a yes. So here's a vertical line that hit more than once, so it fails the vertical line test, not a function. Here's a vertical line that hits the graph multiple times, so it fails the vertical line test, it's not a function. Here, no matter what vertical line I drew, it just hit once, so these passed it and became yeses. Alright, let's go ahead and move on to another example. On this one, they want us to determine the domain and range for this relation or function. And I guess the first thing we could answer is, is it a function? And if you imagine all the vertical lines that could go by, I can never see one that hits more than once. So this is a function. And they want us to list the domain and range. So the domain and range is the set of inputs and outputs that are possible. So when I look at the domain for this one, um, what I want to kind of imagine is that um, what's the smallest graphing calculator window that could hold this in, in its picture? And so I, w I couldn't go any further left, or sorry, I would have to go at least this far left to be able to see that point. And I'd have to go at least this far to the right to see the right edge. I'd have to come up at least this high and down at least this low. If I didn't have at least a window that big, I would miss part of the function. And if you can imagine that um, window, that's usually going to help you figure out your domain and your range. So the domain is about x values. And we want to give a range of values that x could be. And the left side will be what on our graphing calculator would be an x min. And on the right side it would be what would be our x max. So for this window that contains the graph, the left side's at negative 2. And the right side is occurring at 3. So that would be my domain. And for the range, I can just continue with that same idea of the graphing window and say what values are trapping my different values of y. And that's like thinking about the window. How low does this graph go? As low as a y value of negative 2. How high up does the graph go? This would be the top of my window is as high as 4. So those are my domains and ranges. And this is the way they'll ask you to do those is using um, this sort of um, inequality notation and when you have a left and a right you want to put your x in the middle the left side right side when you have a top and a bottom you put your y in the middle bottom and the top so that's the idea of domain and range but we'll look at that a couple more times on the next page alright continuing on let's look at a few more examples of graphs where they want us to figure out the domain and range and I'm going to again remind you of the trick to this, which is to imagine the smallest graphing calculator window that would in hold this graph, or if we made it any smaller, we'd miss some part. So we'd have to have a left edge here, we'd have to have a top edge right here, a right edge here, and a bottom edge down here. And let me go ahead and close that in and make a rectangle out of it. And I think you can see that if that was my graphing calculator window, the entire graph would be contained in there. But if I tried to make it any shorter, I'd miss this. If I tried to pull it into the right, I'd miss the left side. Pull it in this way, I miss this point. Or up, I miss this point. So that's the smallest window that could get the job done. And then I would think, all right, so on that window, what is the far left side and the far right side? Because that left-right idea is an x-axis thing, which would be about domain. 
So my domain would be the set of x's that are on that graph that go as far to the left as here, which has an x of negative 5, and as far to the right of here, and that one has an x. I've kind of scrubbed it over, but 1, 2, 3, 4 squares over. So the domain is from negative 5 to 4. When I go to do the range, that's about the vertical, or the y, and I do the same idea and say, well, how low did this box go? down to a height of 2 squares down or negative 2 and how high did it go and here's where a lot of people make a mistake they'll look at this end and say oh went as high as 1 but if I cut the window off right there I miss a bunch of my graph so the highest spot on the graph isn't here it's somewhere right around there and how high is that point it's at the top of that window 1 2 3 squares up and so I get a 3 so when we do domain and range, it's not about the endpoints of the graph. I mean, sometimes it works out that way, but what it's really about is the far left and far right for domain, and the lowest point and the highest point for range. And in this case, our highest point didn't occur at one of the endpoints. It occurred in the middle. And again, that trick is just trying to imagine drawing a box around that as small as possible. Think of that as your graphing calculator screen, and what's the left side would be x min and x max. Bottom and top would be y min and y max. Let's try it again. So if I try to do that here, it's kind of interesting. I, I could make the minimum of that window. I could draw that in right here, and I wouldn't be missing any part of the graph. But if I try to draw any rectangle beyond that, let's just go like this and, and like that. The arrows here indicate that I'm going to miss some of my graph because it keeps going up. right? So what arrow means it keeps going. So if it keeps going, then I didn't go high enough, right? So I can move it up, but there's still an arrow. It still keeps going. And no matter what I do, I'm never going to be able to capture the top because it keeps going up forever. Well, notice, though, as it keeps going up, it keeps going to the right. And that means eventually, wherever I draw this line, the graph would eventually push past that, too. So if I'm trying to capture this in a graphing calculator window, I never can do it because of the fact that it has these arrows and continues forever. So there's no right boundary that'll work. There's no top that would contain it. There's no left that would contain it, because as it keeps going up, it keeps moving left, so eventually it would cross any line I drew. However, this bottom line does work. Every part of the graph will be above that. There's arrows, but they only point up, not down. So I'd never cross this. So let's think about that. what that means for domain and range. For my domain, I want the left side of the box and the right side of the box, and there is no left that'll work. There is no right that'll work. Essentially what I'm saying is the x values or this graph will go forever to the left eventually. And as it keeps going up, it'll keep going farther and farther to the right. And so the domain is all real numbers. No matter where you tried to draw a window to trap it, you would always have the graph eventually go past that. And then when you do the range, it's a little different because the y values can be bounded from below but not above. So the y values are anything that's greater than or equal to this height at the bottom and that lowest height looks like just one unit up. So that's a little trickier than this kind where we have a, what we call a closed curve where it has stopping points. You can always trap it in some window. But when you've got these arrows you have to think about what that means and a lot of times it means no maximum. So my y grows as the smallest point of one but there's no biggest point. And if there's no um, boundary on either side, you just get all real numbers and throw an S on there. All right, so let's try one final one, graph D. If you think about trying to bound this one, you're going to get in lots of trouble because as you draw this arrow in here, that means two things. Because of the slant of this, it means your graph goes up forever, but also to the right forever. And when you look at this arrow right here, because of the angle on that, it means your graph goes down forever but also left forever. So, like, they've got a window here. Does that contain the graph? No, because that graph's going to keep going up and burst through the, the top of this and the bottom. But eventually, because of the slant, it would go past the right and the left also. So, in this case, when there's no left or right boundary possible, then the do domain is all real numbers. And if there's no bottom or top boundary, then the range is about the vertical or the y values. No top, no bottom means that the range is also all real numbers. So that's a little bit of a discussion about domain and range. Um, the, the basic kind that you want to remember, other than these tricky ones, are the ones that really truly have 
um, limits to them and then the X limits would be the domain and the Y limits form um, your range. Alright, so that discussion of domain and ranges wraps up section 5.2.